Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the second episode of Matrix Mash with me, Emily Moyer, and my good friend, Robert Phoenix. Thank you so much for all the awesome comments we got on the last show about Serena Williams, and we're ready to go for round two. Robert, welcome back. Hey, it's great to be back, Emily, doing this thing. I guess we're going to get into uh, some DiFi today, huh? Some Diane Feinstein. Oh, DiFi. I like that. I haven't heard that before. Dude. Yeah, that's what they call her back in the Bay Area, DiFi. So we'll, we'll get into some of that stuff and, uh, and see what we can dig out and dig around and how it relates to what's going on with, with uh, uh, Kavanaugh and yeah. Christine Blassie and all that. The, all Kavanaugh, that the, the Kavanaugh sense. The Kavanaugh sense. Absolutely. We have, we have QAnon sense and now we have Kavanaugh sense. And yep. I, I coined the QAnon sense, but I have to uh, hat tip to Tabitha Wallace from watching the Hawks. She had a program about the Kavanaugh sense the other day. And I was like, yeah, that's really good. I like the Kavanaugh sense. You know, when I think about Diane Feinstein, the two things that keep coming to my mind are Frankenstein and Einstein, right? <laughs> there are problems with both. And she seems to encapsulate some of each of those problems. You know, she's no spring chicken either. She was born in 1933. Yeah. So what is she? She's, what, 85? Is that Fucking right? Fucking retire already, dude. Enjoy all that money. 85 years old. 85 it, years old. Like it, 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 to me, this is crazy. Like, retire. Go enjoy all the money that you've stolen from the people. Like, what are you still doing? <laughs> yeah, we talked about this. And, um, well, we get into the astrological component. Yeah. And right now, she, she really can't retire because – She's kind of at a peak right now, astrologically. We can get into some of that. Um, but, yeah, I've got three charts lined up, ready to go. But maybe we should do a little background. Yeah, please. And tell people why we're, we're talking about this today. And why she's so busy for an 85-year-old. Yeah. So, so this whole thing came up when uh, this uh, <clears throat> doctor, professor, Christine uh, Blassie Ford, got in touch with her and said that uh, she'd been – molested not raped by the way there's no rape here there's no police report there's a police record there's nothing that says that there was any rape the story goes like this that she was at an event between two prep schools back in washington dc her prep school was in bethesda maryland and uh, kavanaugh's prep school was in washington dc not very far actually from the supreme court uh building in washington dc so he went to Georgetown Prep, which is pretty well known back there. And she went to, what was it, uh, Holton Arms? Is that, mm -hmm. uh, um, anyway, um, so they had a mixer. And I think this was around 1980. It might have been like maybe just after they were out of high school, very close, right around there. And supposedly, uh, Brett Kavanaugh, got in a room with Christine Blasey and they were doing something. He got on top of her and, you know, started hard kissing her. And this is, this is the story that we're being given by, by Feinstein and the media. Well, turns out that there's another potential story that could have broken last year where apparently Blasey had the same complaint that she was ready to lodge against Neil Gorsuch. <laughs> so this this came out on Rush Limbaugh, I think today or yesterday, and what that what that basically says is is that they're all part of the same group. Yep. Like Gorsuch and Kavanaugh went to the same high school together. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So this uh, is theater from both sides. Yeah, Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh's older than Gorsuch by a year, and um, you you really latched onto this when I was talking on my show. Um, the other day about how uh, Kavanaugh's mother was a judge. She was a, you know, a, a district judge in, in uh, Maryland. And she actually presided over a number of cases over, over Ralph Blassie and Ralph Blassie's real estate holdings. And in fact, in one case, she actually had to rule on a uh, foreclosure against Blassie. So there's some really interesting entanglement with the two families from a legal perspective. And then you and I were talking about and how I rolled out all that stuff about Blassie being the banker for the CIA. And then yeah. there's this connection with Dr. Frederick Melgus, Melgus being the, the great kind of, you know, mind control professor at Stanford. 
mm-hmm. and how Blassie is one of his students. So Frederick Melgis, he, he actually practices and is a, 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 a kind of a master at, of mind control. And He's, isn't that what she, isn't she a professor over a program that would have some of these CIA kind of people, trainees in it? Isn't that what yeah. she sort of does at yeah. Stanford now? Absolutely. She, she, yeah. She's a professor at Stanford, right? She went That's there right. and she's a professor there? That's right, yep. And, and tell me real quick, what, what college did Kavanaugh go to? Um, I believe Kavanaugh was Yale twice. Okay. So, so, so all right. he, yeah. So he went to Yale um, for undergrad and then Yale for uh, law. And I think Gorsuch went, um, where did he go? I think he went Columbia, Princeton. So it's interesting how they have it like lined up so that it could have been launched this thing with Gorsuch for some reason they decided not to at that point or she wasn't triggered in the appropriate manner or something like this to me, like, it's, I mean, it is obvious to anyone who's watching that this is theater from one side, but, and this is my concern with everybody with everything is people think, oh, Democrats bad, but the Republicans are good in this case. No, nah, I think that there's uh, shit being puppeteered from that side too. Like I'm really more and more starting to think, I mean, I think this in general about everything, but like when you're looking at this case, I mean, this is, Kavanaugh's in on this. Like he's, this is part of when you're, when you ascend to these levels of power and privilege and all this kind of stuff, public shaming is part of that. You sign up for that. You agree to that. That's, you know, like that's sometimes it happens. And I think in a way that you maybe like didn't really expect, or it's a little more humiliating than you thought it was going to be. But this is not being puppeteered only by one side. There is something up top running both sides of this. And yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, this is how the mind control programs work. MKUltra kind of things, they put, they use their own children in these programs, you know, and it is entirely possible that her entire purpose, that her, so much of her programming has, you know, stuff set in place to be triggered right now at this time for this reason, or maybe there's a lot, you know, maybe, maybe she, maybe, you know, maybe, I mean, a traumatic thing happens and then you put in codes that can then be triggered at any time later for some specific reason or purpose or whatever. And her purpose may be being revealed right now. Could be. I mean, there's a, there's a strong chance that she could be an MK ultra um, asset. Although she doesn't necessarily, um, she doesn't necessarily conform to sort of the standard model. Like I don't have a full background on her, but I don't think she had that breakdown just before she was around 28 or 29. I mean, she doesn't have any kind of the, the wild at times, you know, slightly psychotic or schizophrenic behavior where these, you know, these parts of the brain are trying to take over at certain points in time. So then just more in on it herself, you're thinking. I think she's, I think she may have some of it. She may have some Mm -hmm. programming, um, but is she Kathy O'Brien where, Right. You know, you utter a word and all of a sudden she'll do anything that, you know, you want her to do or, you know, along those lines. I tend to think she's probably more of um, the daughter of an operative. Yeah. And Ralph Blassie has had a very strong connection with the CIA for um, a number of years. And I cover this on my show that uh, there was a, a guy back in, um, back in, what was it? This was the 80s. And his name was Nicholas Deacon. And Nicholas Deacon was killed by a woman by the name of Lois Lang. Yeah, yeah. And Lois Lang was kind of this homeless woman that had been taken in by this Melgus character, mm-hmm. the guy who's this professor at Stanford who does all this MK Ultra programming. So he took her in, and then he probably turned her into truly what we're now talking about, an MK Ultra. Uh, yeah assassin yeah you know la femme the key kind of style right mm-hmm. and she got the program and she went out and she found deacon and this deacon guy was connected to blassie and it was all about the money um that they were using to funnel through from you know the contras the sale of the cocaine and all the stuff that was going on and then when reagan got in you know he found out about it and he was like wow we gotta we gotta do something different about this this is Although it continued to go on for a while after that. Right. So, but what's, what's interesting, here's where the, 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 there's this 
fascinating bifurcation is that the Bushes are standing by um, uh, Kavanaugh, Brett Kavanaugh, mm -hmm. and the Clintons are not. So, oh, so, oh, this is interesting. So is that what this is really about? Is there a fissure in the Bush-Clinton cabal? Could be. Could be. And the reason why is that there is some deep loyalty to Kavanaugh because I believe both Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, but certainly Kavanaugh, I'm pretty sure, um, served on, under Bush. He was part wow. of the Bush administration. Yeah. So there's, there's some ties here. And if indeed there are lines towards money laundering and cocaine black budgets, of course the Bushes are going to be very, very concerned about it. But so are the Clintons, by the way, because they're involved in it You too. know what's interesting, though? They, I was, it, it's so funny. I've been having some funny thought, thoughts the last couple of days. And wasn't there just right before this Kavanaugh thing started, wasn't there some reports of uh, planes being sent to uh, Arkansas to collect documents and collect boxes and stuff like that? You know, maybe these things are somehow related. Yeah, I've heard, I heard that. I heard a little rumor of that. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. And then yeah. I, also, I also had this funny thought, and this is maybe a little bit of an aside, but it's so funny how Bill Clinton is from Hope, Arkansas. That's right. And all the stuff with Obama was based on hope and hope change, and, change. And his book was yeah. The Audacity of Hope. Yeah. Like, yeah. is this matrix, is this uh, simulation coding? Is there something fritzing here? Like, uh, could be, could be. I mean, it, the, the thing with Clinton, you know, I keyed on, I keyed on, on that back in like 2000 and the nine when Obama mm -hmm. was running like, Oh, he's from hope and hope and change. Oh, wow. This is this interesting. Yeah, it could be. It absolutely could be, but there's, so we're, we're witnessing some very um, sort of draconian, you know, uh, uh, theater here. I mean, this is real high, yeah. high level Mandarin theater with Illuminati families um, kind of entangled and trying to either sort out power, uh, protect their uh, power interests that are based on relationships with people that have been in power, i.e. the Bushes. Yeah. So nothing is as, it's, as it seems no. with this whole, whole deal, right? And this has totally captivated everything. Like, there, what, like nobody's paying attention to anything else that's going on. It's totally overshadowing whatever happened with the Russia, Syria, Israel thing the other day. Every, all people talk about all day is this Kavanaugh thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. And the Russia, Israel, Syria thing is really wild and bizarre and, um, there are people in Russia who, just to let people know, if you're not familiar with it, there was a, a Russian, it essentially was kind of like a large aircraft, kind of doubling as a bomber, sort of intelligence gathering aircraft, flying at a fairly high altitude. And it was shot out of the sky by a Syria S-200 missile system that was given to them actually by the Russians. There are more advanced systems. There's the S-300 and the S-400 being the latest version of that, which is way more sophisticated. Of course, the Russians are not going to give their best shit to the Syrians. So what happened was is that the Israelis have been doing these, these missile strafes, and they've been doing these missile strafes into Syria now for close to a year. So, and it's never talked about because what they'll do is they'll get right up to the Syrian border and then they'll fire their missiles, you know, from Israeli or sort of, you know, this kind of strange neutral airspace. And that way they're not violating any kind of, you know, sort of border etiquette or whatever that mm -hmm. means. So what happened was, was that, um, the, the, that they theoretically planned a sortie, meaning they're the Israeli jets, which I believe are F-15s, they're American mm -hmm. jet fighters, um, they were flying at a certain altitude, and they were flying beneath this Russian um, sort of bomber intelligence gatherer. And because the S-200 has kind of this fail-safe in it where it goes after the, the aircraft that's at the highest altitude, mm -hmm. that's what it went after. So um, instead of going after the Israeli fighters went after and it hit that bomber uh, intelligence gatherer. And then as a result of this, now Putin has done nothing and he's actually starting to experience some heat mm -hmm. in Russia because he hasn't done anything. He hasn't retaliated, but he's really tight with BB Netanyahu. And, ah. and, and I think the Russians are way more in bed with um, Israel and, and well, that would be that would be as Israel would be playing both sides. 
course. Right. Yeah, yeah. Of course. And, you know, and they say that they, they found the remains of these, these uh, airmen. We don't know that. I mean, it could have been, uh, uh, you know, I mean, we don't. Here's and this what could I think, all be hogwash, too. Yeah, here's what I think people should really begin to wrap their heads around. Is we don't know shit. Yeah. Okay, which is why we do these shows. Yeah. So that we could try to, you know, untangle some of these things so that they make sense or at the very least are interesting to decode. Yeah, no, I mean, we don't, I mean, this is the crazy place that we're at now is we don't really know that these things are actually happening. That's right. That's right. And, and, and since we're on the subject, this gets into what happened at the observatory in New Mexico. Yeah. It, so you know, nice. Originally, it was stated that, you know, there was maybe some, you know, kooky sun stuff going on and they shut it down because... You know, there was stuff on the on the computers. They'd seen things. There was a simultaneously shutdown of six different webcams from uh, observatories. You know, from Hawaii to Australia, and then it comes out that there now it has to do with like pedophilia, and mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, well, this is bizarre because you know who's bringing the pedophilia charge? Well, it's the FBI, and mm -hmm. do you really trust the FBI? Right? Do you really trust that all of a sudden now they're going to get hip to pedophilia? So the story is that there's a janitor there, and he used the, the, the Wi-Fi to get online mm -hmm. and to download all kinds of like child porn. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about that. This is so interesting. So you know what else happened yes, yesterday? And I, I don't pay attention to it, but it just came up in my feed, of course, with Jordan Sather saying that yesterday QAnon made some posts confirming that there's secret space program. Right, and so the so observatory gets shut down. I think you even made the comment that, or you were reading an article where they were talking about like, oh, they have to shut down the observatory because they don't want people to see what's really up there. Then QAnon comes and says, oh, secret space program. At the same time, all this talk about this is going on, and then this pedophilia thing. One of the things I've been saying for a really long time is that there is this really like funky and some in some ways hard to explain connection between pedophilia and the secret space program in that mm. one of the things that I identified sort of early on in my deprogramming is that those two were linked in a way that uh, as soon as I started to um, deal with and have some understanding and realizations about some of the sexual abuse that occurred for me when I was younger, right? There started to be people showing up trying to say that, that, trying to really sell me on that I had been part of the secret space program and all this kind of stuff, right? Like I've always felt like some of these secret space memories are screen memories for sexual abuse, mm -hmm. right? These things are inextricably linked in a way that is hard to explain, but they go together. I mean, think about it. Even when people talk about like having been abducted by an alien, you often hear them talking about anal probing, right? Yeah. Wouldn't that be something your mind would do if you can't accept that it's someone you know doing that to you, that it projects an other onto that? Yeah, 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 that's true. And it would be an absolutely, you know, kind of brilliant cover. Totally. For something like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, I've heard, like, um, other kinds of sort of mixed memory, false memory montage stuff where mm – -hmm. You know, people have witnessed like Bush or somebody like that turning to an alien. Mm -hmm. And really what was going on is that they were using some kind of a screen projection mm -hmm. to get people to think that that's what was really happening. Mm -hmm. When in actuality, they were just, you know, taking their, their uh, liberties with them yep. and, and uh, traumatizing them at the same time. So, you know, I, I mean, I think that there could be something to that. Um, uh, you know, who's, the, who's the guy, the, uh, the dentist and An Andrew, um, Masaggio. He's, he's, you know, he's not a dentist. He's a lawyer and he's lawyer. the one. Yeah, the a, I, I got him confused with this other guy. Yeah. Uh, the, time, the time traveling dentist. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, so Masaggio, um, talks a lot about being in that sp secret space program as a kid. Right. right? He, ca he, ca he calls it something different, but yes. But, but that's his thing, right? He yeah. talks about it. Uh, he, yeah. he calls it project Pegasus and something else. He talks about going to Mars and he talks about time travel. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't, I, I'm not here to dispel Bisaggio. I mean, there might be some real truth to that, but uh, from what I've seen and how he actually interacts and communicates, I mean, he's like scrambled most of the time. Agreed. Uh, you know? So, I mean, I, so I think that there is whatever happened with him. Mm-hmm whether it was the fact that he was taken to another planet or time space or, or he was traumatized or he was traumatized 
clearly I think it's had an effect on him because he's yeah, no, very difficult to follow and listen to. I agree. I, my sense about him and, you know, he's from the same town that I'm from. We went to the same high school and we have some crossover in some of our experiences. My, my feeling about him has always been that he is telling the truth as he understands it. He's just misunderstanding a mind control experience for a space and time travel experience. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's an interesting kind of piece now that they're, attributing the shutdown mm -hmm. to a guy that had like, you know, pedophilia. So what they did. And it's a janitor, right? It's never the high up who's doing the pedophilia. It's the janitor. Right. So they went to the janitor's place and they got suitcases and all this other, but did they really have to shut everything down? And, and by the way, let's look at this from like a really kind of lucid perspective. If these, these observatories generally have fairly high security systems, Mm -hmm. associated with them. So if somebody's getting online mm -hmm. and using their Wi-Fi yep. consistently, that's easy to spot. Okay. It's easy to spot internally. If mm -hmm. they're connected to the NSA or they're connected to the CIA or whomever, right? Most probably the NSA yep. that they would be, you know, it would be part of a grid where things are being observed. And if there's any untoward activity, they're going to let people know about it. And very early yeah. on, if, they, if he's going to these weird websites, which are easy to trace, all they have to do is disable the DNSs, and he can't go there anymore, and they could have dipped this in the bud, what, yeah. two, three weeks ago, okay? Yeah. So here's what I think. I think that the janitor was a spy. Okay. That's what I think. I think the janitor was an agent. I don't know who he was working for. I don't believe he's got child porn. Um, on those computers or on on the suitcases, I think the FBI is lying through their teeth because that's what they do. Yep, they wouldn't tell us that. I think that, and, and the janitor wasn't just any janitor, because if you're going to go in and you're going to get in on either their Wi-Fi or get in on their mainframe, you got to know what the fuck you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm assuming that this janitor was a significant hacker. Mm -hmm. And was getting raw data feeds and has a bunch of stuff that um, they've been compiling and either willing to sell to other governments or other groups. And, and I think that's what happened. Mm. I think what they did is they found a high level mole that had gotten in there and was capturing and getting, and getting ready to disperse their whatever data. And they had okay, to yeah. shut everything down to try and do as quick clean up and get recapture as much stuff as they could and see what else is out there that he didn't get. Ah, very good, Robert. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. So the pedophilia thing is just, I think it's a ruse. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think, I think you're dealing with, with a, an actual high level operative that got in there. Very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Okay, that was quite a that was quite a little um, side trail on the rabbit hole. We, we just I had no down. idea we were going there. <laughs> Me either, but that's the that's the beauty of this. So I know, yeah. yeah. So let's get into this um, this Diane Feinstein stuff. Yeah. And I want to bring up one thing, uh, which is sort of this interesting like backstory that's connected to Diane Feinstein and how she became the mayor of San Francisco. Let's hear it. And she became the mayor of San Francisco because Dan White, who was a, at one point in time a police officer, he had been in Vietnam. He, he was a sergeant in Vietnam, came back. Uh, he was a police officer. He got kicked out of the, of the um, SFPD because he reported a cop beating up a suspect. And it was like, he, you know, he, he, ratted on one of his fellow cops so they said you can't be here so he left and he got a job with the fire department and he became a hero and he because he saved somebody he saved a mother and a daughter at a, at a building so they they you know they called him the white knight right that was his mm -hmm. last name the white knight and he got this kind of heroic sort of buzz and vibe and people latched on to him and he became uh the uh, a supervisor in San Francisco during the 1970s. So the supervisors didn't make a whole lot of money and he was complaining about it. You know, he, he tried to open a, a potato skin restaurant or stand on <laughs> Pier, Pier 39, didn't work out. So, so eventually he gets so frustrated that he's not making enough money 
that he gives his resignation to the mayor, George Moscone, who's, you know, a complete dirtbag. And Moscone um, thinks about it, and all of a sudden, people like Harvey Milk and Willie Brown and Diane Feinstein tell him it's not a good idea. Don't do it. Don't, don't give him his job back. So when he hears this, Dan, Knight, Dan White hears this, he gets pissed off, and he decides that he's going to go in and he's going to kill George Moscone and kill Harvey Milk. He was going to kill everybody. And in order to do that, he went through a very elaborate uh, plan because you couldn't take a gun through the metal detector at City Hall in San Francisco. So he found a window down in the basement to a bathroom, and he was able to somehow jerry-rig that window. Again, I don't know how big the window was. Dan White was not a small guy. So he had to get through that window. Once he got through that window with his gun intact, he went in and he, he killed Moscone. He killed Milk. And um, he was on his way to killing a couple others. But he turned himself in, which was quite odd in some ways, but not inconsistent with his character. So what happened after that is there was... But he a, didn't kill Diane Feinstein. No, and she becomes mayor of San Francisco. Interesting. A, after this. Now, what's really interesting is that this happens during a time where San Francisco is plunged into social turmoil because not only does Dan White kill Moscone and Milk, and Milk, of course, the beloved mayor of Castro Street, but, but also Dan White basically gets off with a very, very light sentence. And he gets off using what's called the Twinkie defense, and that he ate too many Twinkies. And it, the, tw the chemicals in the Twinkies impaired his judgment. I kid you not. Well, I do, I do, I do. You know me, I'm a sugar is programmable matter. So to me, that actually that sounds reasonable. Sound too far right? So, <laughs> so, right a so right after that, not, not long after that, the whole Jonestown thing happens. Uh, and there's all these connections with Jonestown and San Francisco, Jim Jones at the temple. Yeah. The temple, beautiful yeah. old San Francisco. Um, there's Leo Ryan, who represents the San Mateo County, San Francisco, part of San Francisco. So there's all these San Francisco roots. People are from San Francisco. They're a part of jo Jonestown. And guess what they did? They would have these drills in Jonestown. They were trauma drills. Of course and, they were. <laughs> yeah. So they basically, they planned for an event like when Leo Ryan went down to Guyana and basically, you know, took a bird's eye view of what was happening there. And Jim Jones uh, drilled people in, into, co into committing mass suicide. Right. So it wasn't like it was their first dance when right. he was there. They, they, they had actually practiced this. And didn't they, and, drink, didn't they drink Kool-Aid in Jonestown? Yeah. That's, more, that's, more, it was, more sugar is programmable. <laughs> but it was, it was Kool-Aid at least with arsenic, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, um, the, they had a name for these for these operations for these drills, and the name for the drill was Operation White Knight. Oh, that's fascinating. Which is which is what Dan White was called, the White Knight. So there's all this weird programming around White and uh, Jonestown and Jim Jones, and then ultimately Diane Feinstein, who comes to power. Um, as a result of that, and she sees, I was like, she wasn't just elected. Like, if you were there at the Bay Area and were witnessing this, she seized power. She was like a Rome. She was like a Caesar. Mm -hmm. That's what she did. You know, the city almost bent to her her will in some ways because they were looking for somebody who was strong and maternal, right? So she mm -hmm. came in. She had the maternal vibe. She brought that strength thing and then she was mayor for a very long time and that letter and catapulted her into being a senator and a lifetime of corruption and crime. beyond belief yeah yeah so we had a bunch wasn't of wasn't there a, a movie of, called white knights too with mikhail barishkinoff mikhail barishnikov and gregory hines yeah it's white mikhail barishnikov gregory hines and um isabella rosalini yeah yeah okay so go on uh, yeah all right yeah so um one of the things that we talked about was all these bullet points of corruption that I, I went over them on my show. Yeah. We could go over them today if you want. But you also had some interesting stuff to bring in from the gymnastics side. 
Well, my question is this, is that like, well, aside from the fact that she's 85 years old and still doing this and doesn't show any signs of, of you know, looking to Slowing retire. down? Yes. Right? Why is she somehow the point person on all these cases that are somehow tied to some kind of sexual abuse, right? So like with the gymnastics, like she was heading up a bill and so all the gymnasts and all the, you know, whatever were kind of, you know, supporting her and, and, and going to her and trusting her because she was basically pushing a bill that said, you have to report sexual abuse, which is a no brainer. Like this is not some, you know, but she had, I don't, this weird thing where she has the trust of all these people and some of these people who've trusted her and worked with her are not stupid people. And I don't, you know, and should take a look at this and see like what this is like Fox hen house shit. Right. And then this one pops up with the, the that is again, you know, her as the middle, the middleman pinpoint person, you know, on this situation that involves some sort of, um, molestation of an underage person and what's going to happen based on that now in the Senate, which was the same, you know, which is what she was doing with the gymnastics thing too. How does she like, why, why is she the point person for all of this? Why is she sort of this gatekeeper as to how this will move from like the social sphere? And, and also mind you, both of these things have now become attached to the me too movement, right? This is all me too kind of stuff. And like, what is this? Like why, you know, I mean, I understand that people are asleep and under mind control and, and whatever. And there is also something to the point of, you know, with the gymnasts where it's like, okay, well, whatever her past was, she's pushing this thing that's important to us. So let's stand behind her. But nobody ever stops to ask, well, why is she doing that? Is she this person who sits there to try and gain the trust of people? So she gets all of these stories because she's really there to control who knows what about what, because there's, you know, something running in the background that people are not aware of mm -hmm. and, and she's there to sort of collect information on it from both from all sides mm -hmm. yeah well why don't we look at her chart that might give yeah. us a an interesting insight and i got a couple of charts for her that i kind of wanted to go over not and not uh get um where are we let's do this not get too into the weeds with it but yes 30 minutes is long out the window guys <laughs> At least for this episode. <laughs> Robert is an expert in time dilation, so. <laughs> That's me, the time adjuster. Um, so, this, so this is a really interesting chart in a lot of ways. Now, it doesn't really reflect the chart of what we would call like a well-known public servant, somebody that's really out there in the public eye. I mean, everything you can see, everything is below the horizon. Yeah. So the, the only thing that she has above the horizon is Saturn in Aquarius, which I'll get to in the subsequent chart. And that's over in the 11th house, which is... So if you think of the horizon as where you can see and below the... Right? So like everything with her is hidden and there's only a small amount of truth that's exposed. And of course, that's related to Saturn. Well, so... Is that what that means? The, the below the horizon is indicative of things that are more personal in the chart. Okay. Like, the, you know, the fourth house means you're, you're engaged in your family, your roots, um, life that's close to home, fifth house, children, pleasure. These are all more personal kinds of stages of development and um, access. When you go above the horizon, you're moving out of that realm and into the upper part of the chart, which tends to be more about the world and more transpersonal. So she doesn't – what's interesting about her – is that she has a very, very different chart between San Francisco and Washington, D.C., which I'll, which I'll talk about. Okay. So, so she has all these planets below the horizon, and she's got this anoretic degree of 29 Pisces, which is a very interesting degree. The 29th degree of Pisces is the same degree that's shared by uh, Harvey Weinstein and Baron Trump. They're both 29 degrees Pisces. Interesting. And, and you think of Weinstein doesn't sound that different than Feinstein, Baron, Trump. You think about an oil baron, and she's the clean energy baron. This is very fascinating. Well, that's, yes, yes, absolutely. And so I would say when you look at Feinstein, 
she looks like a very old, creaky old soul, yeah. right? Even when you go back and look at pictures of her when she was young, she looks old. There's yep. nothing remotely sparkly or new or fresh about her. Not She's at all. just, you know, so this is, this is somebody based on that 29th degree. That is the last degree of the Zodiac, by the way. You know, and this is the ascendant. So this is how she kind of appears to the world. You know, she's certainly she's cronish in her, you know, kind of evolutionary development now, but she's always kind of been that way. You know, she's always, and you, and you said that she's got this kind of like, like, you know, wicked witch of the West kind of yeah. vibe. And, yeah. she, and, and I think this is her 29 degree Pisces ascendant. Now, the other thing that's really interesting about her is that she is vehemently anti-gun, mm -hmm. but she also has Aries in the first house. And there are pictures of her with AR-15s, and yep. there's a part of her where she, I think she's got gun lust. You well, know, I think, if, you, I, if you've been engaged in all the corruption she's been engaged in, I'd be afraid of the people having guns too. Yeah. But I'd I've, make I've, sure I've, I had one. Yeah. yeah. But here's where, here's where I think the, the, the answer to your question, like why is she this point person? Well, if you go down to the bottom of her chart, Mm -hmm. she, her son is at cancer, zero cancer. And cancer is the sign of the mother. Mm -hmm. so, so she's got this mother thing going on. And it's right there at the bottom of her chart, which is absolutely conjunct the IC. So she's got her son in the fourth house. That's cancer's house. And it's zero degrees cancer. So she's like this, I don't, you know, she's like the mother to the gymnastic girls, right? right. That's in her chart. And what's also interesting is she has this trine. It's exact from her son to the true node, which is in the sign of Pisces. And that's in the 12th house, and it's hidden, and it's tucked away. And Pisces can, can represent a lot of different sort of flavors and vibrations. And, you know, Pisces can be really profoundly spiritual, but it can also be very, very deceptive and it can, you know, be involved in things like esoterica and the occult. So she has easy access. She has easy access to, I believe, um, either occult or esoteric energies that come to her through that 12th house. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if, you know, Diane Feinstein is deeply engaged in ritual work. That's, that's my you sense. You think she's like part of like the Temple of Set kind of thing going on over there in San Francisco? I don't, I don't know because there's never really been any like hardcore links. Like whenever we think about people like that, we think about Hillary Clinton and, right. you know, I don't, I don't know who, falls, who else falls into that bucket so neatly. But I would say that she's involved in something. Hmm. She's got something going on. And it's interesting you bring up the Temple of Set because you and I were talking about this yesterday and how San Francisco is this hotbed for satanic activity and yeah. has been for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it really, it really is. And we were talking about whenever I go to San Francisco, as much as I enjoy uh, the, the dining and some of the culture, like I feel like I need a shower when I leave there. And I don't just I mean know. like a bath. I mean like I need something to cleanse, you know, like a spiritual shower. Um, and it stays, it's, it, it lingers, you know what I mean? Like it lingers and there's a darkness there that is um, palpable when you're there and in your body when you've gone. Um, and it's, um, it's so fascinating to me that so many people are so attracted to it. Like I can't tell you how many people that I know that, for, that from when I've lived in various places like Austin and, and New York and whatever that just cannot wait to move to San Francisco. You know what I mean? It's like a magnet. Um, and it's so interesting. Well, there's something really supernatural about San Francisco. And, you know, I lived there for off and on for um, a few, you know, quite a few years, mm -hmm. mostly off. I'd say about the total amount of time I lived in San Francisco was about for two years, mm -hmm. but for the two and a half years. But the time that I did live there, I had some of the most wild, supernatural, um, crazy experiences of my life. So there's a lot of interesting energy mm -hmm. with San Francisco. And, you know, some people believe that, um, you know, it's because it's where the, the Pacific and the continental plates, you know, mm -hmm. sort of meet and divide. And there's this, you know, major fissure 
Well, the, okay. the fault lines, I wonder what kind of energies are coming up and with all the earthquakes and the shaking and whatever kind of stuff and the fires and it is, it is interesting. Oh, totally. You know, and um, there, there, there've been some really interesting work done on, on like uh, places like Mount Diablo mm -hmm. um, and uh, Mount Hamilton and San Jose. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so yeah. And, and, um, um, and the, the one in uh, Marin County, uh, Mount Tamapias. Mm -hmm. So these three mountains apparently were like these dome caps that came in and they're mm. part of like a really interesting ley line network that runs through the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interesting spiritual and multidimensional energy there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you wanted to get involved in some kind of occult or esoteric practice, I mean, you know, clearly that would be a place to be because, you know, I think the veil is pretty thin in San Francisco. Yep. So you've got people like Michael Aquino and Anton LaVey, you know, all hanging out there. And they're, you know, they're tip of the iceberg people. They're the ones that we know about. And there's other yeah. people. Right. Yeah. They're, 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 the, they're the public relations at time. Uh, right. And out just outside of San Francisco, you know, you have the Bohemian Grove. Mm-hmm which is um, oh petaluma and all that area up there petaluma. is so weird yeah right so all it's all class, you know, we've done talked about before yeah all that so, stuff. so yeah. the area itself i think has has it hardwired into it in petaluma is where the noetic uh the the what's the place called yeah ions institute of noetic ions. sciences i've been there a very strange place um, and so this is a place where they really worked on psi abilities and remote viewing and all that kind of stuff. So I would imagine that part of the reason that place was chosen is because the veil is thin there and it's easy, you know, like that's a place where that, that energy is loosened up and you can really work with it. Maybe. Um, I was there too. I, I, did a, I did a tour there and I did a couple of pieces on uh, some people that worked there. Did you do the, the staring exercise? No, I went there just, Kara had a workshop there. And so I went there for Kara's workshop, mm -hmm. but it was a very interesting place. And it was like really hidden and hard to find. Yeah. Um, and just, it was super, the energy there was, was interesting. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, I didn't get to sort of dig in and do whatever most people do when they go there. Cause I was there for a very specific purpose. Um, but I did notice that there was some interesting yeah. So, so, and by the way, the most powerful psychics and mediums I ever ran across were in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, and I've been all over the place. So there's, there's something to that. Um, one of the things that you and I were talking about with Feinstein, and this is something that, that I covered on my show, was this whole thing that was connected to what's now the Tesla plant. Mm-hmm. In, in which is in the South Bay, it's in Fremont, which is actually part of Alameda County. Mm -hmm. And Feinstein got involved with this clean tech thing. And clean tech started off as like a hedge fund in Silicon Valley, where they were basically promoting all these clean technologies that were going to supplant like coal and oil and petroleum and all that stuff. So what happened was is that they got caught up in a bunch of corruption. Yeah, and and the corruption was specifically with Solyndra, and Solyndra was a business that was creating these glass tubes mm -hmm. that you put inside of these solar panels. And what they didn't realize is when they started the business, or they probably did, is that the Chinese were going to undercut them. Their business was going to be a failure. Right. So they lost a shitload of money, and they this was didn't a company. It or they knew that, and they that was also part of the plan. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So and, uh, that money was taxpayer money. Yeah. And they were talking like trillions of dollars. Is that part like, of the technology transfer? Like that's what's always happening is that these people, these corrupt people are always transferring technology backdoor shit to fucking China. The Clintons, Bill Clinton was absolutely. involved in that. Absolutely. That's always part of this shit. It was, it, was, it was, I think, billions of dollars that they lost through Solyndra. Yeah. So don't want to get into the weeds too much here, but um, what happened with Feinstein is she's been in charge of that facility Mm -hmm. through her husband's real estate investment company for years. Mm -hmm. So whether it was the NUMI plant, because it started off as a GM plant, and then it became a NUMI plant, NUMI being the uh, uh, combination of Ford, uh, I'm sorry, GM and Toyota, and then it became Solyndra, and now it's Tesla. Right. And not only did, did they, do they have the land and the building, but they're also in charge of the staffing of Tesla. Like, would you drill down and look at what Diane Feinstein 
is in conjunction with her husband, Richard Bloom. She's a crime boss. Yeah. It's exactly what she is. She is a freaking crime boss. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, it is, I didn't know about the staffing thing, but it is so interesting. The amount of weird stuff and deception and corruption around all of those things. And what is the importance of this one particular site, right? Why, like, why does, you know, from what I understand from some of the things you've shared with me and some other research that Tesla was basically kind of forced into this. Like it was like really made very clear and very, that it was very important that it be there. Why? What's going on there? What is that building an edifice for? What's underneath the ground there? What is that building made of? Is there surveillance going on there? Is there blackmail going on there? Is there a base underneath there? Or it's a really, really interesting point. And um, you know, this is what I love about you because you bring in stuff like this. It's like, hmm, let me think about that. And if you look at the Bay Area, the Bay Area is a hotbed of militarized intelligence, mm -hmm. um, university intelligence, think mm -hmm. tanks. So if you go into the Berkeley Hills, you have DARPA. Mm -hmm. right there in the Berkeley Hills. If you go across the Bay, you have Stanford uh, and you have the, uh, the, uh, the Livermore Labs and, and the yep. Linear Accelerator. Yep. You've got SRI. Mm -hmm. um, you've got Moffett Field, which is an old military base. You've got the Presidio. It's all, yeah. And now it's we have there. this talk about this, this plant. Yep. Uh, this new me slash Solyndra slash Tesla plant. And you're right. Absolutely. Lockheed is in the Bay Area. I mean, who knows really what's kind of going on beneath everything. Now, you get to a certain part of the Bay Area and it becomes very difficult to do stuff underground because there's a lot of the Bay Area that's built on landfill. So mm -hmm. if you go any further, I think, south of that Numi plant, you're running into uh, uh, Alviso and Milpitas, which are um, they're not very solid in terms of their, their land mass. Mm -hmm. So that might be sort of the, sort of the kind of the end point if they're doing the boundary, any, the boundary yeah. of whatever yeah. the underground complex is there. Right. Yeah. So it's very interesting. Now, you, now this is a weird synchronicity and you and I were, we talked about this before. So I decided to go in and try to find some of the back history, like when the, that building was actually, you know, built or if there's any kind of, you know, dirt around it and i'm, I'm just going to do a quick uh, sc screen share with people so they can see this jasper let me do it jasper's like insisted on being the star of the show today he's gone for a whole ton of screen time yeah jasper is, is his tail his head everything he's being a little uh obstreperous i think the word is All right, let me see if i can find the um let's quickly this here we go let's do this Grab this. We don't want the corruption piece. We don't want that. Um, hold on. Nine times out of ten, I get this thing to just pop. Um, let's try this. I don't think this is it. I think this is the, the Feinstein corruption. Let me see if I can move it in here. Hold on one second. Maybe that'll help. No. Okay, for some reason, it's not popping. But let me just read okay. this. Um, so I found, I found, I found this, uh, newspaper called the Argus and it's still around. Anyway, they talk about breaking ground on the General Motors plant in Fremont. And I looked at it and I'm like, wow, this is really interesting because the day that they broke ground on this plant in Fremont is on September 20th, 1961. And here we are on September 20th, just mm -hmm. happening to talk about this thing. Yeah. So I don't know if that's some kind of synchronicity or clue, but I found it to be very unusual. That this, it, To me, like this is simulation stuff, right? Like this is, um, to me, this is the kind of evidence that we're in some kind of coded simulation here, you know? Very interesting. Go on. No, I don't really have much more to add about okay. that, except that, you know, that it's unusual. And, um, uh, and, well, what, and but, but also what happened, uh, what else, what, uh, I think this is interesting considering what our last episode was about, what happened on, what else happened on 9-20-1963? Well, that's a really good point, which I, which 
thank you for jogging my memory. So on in ninth, this is in 1973. Mm-hmm. On September 20th, there were two significant events that took place. One was when Billie Jean King mm-hmm. beat Bobby Riggs in the much ballyhooed and hyped Battle of the Sexes, mm-hmm. which a number of people think that Bobby Bobby Riggs threw for a significant amount of money, which could be the case. Um, that day, earlier that day in Natchitoches, Louisiana, there was a plane crash, and on that plane was the singer, the very popular singer at that time, Jim Croce. So we have this very strange sequence of events where there's this very charged kind of moment in time. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the tide is turning between the sexes. Billie Jean King from San Francisco, by the way. And the tide is turning. I mean, I mean, this was a big hyped event. I mean, this, you know, this is with uh, the wide world of sports, Howard Coast, Howard Cosell, right? Yeah. And the this thrill is of the victory, era. the agony of defeat. Yeah, right. I mean, this this is the era of the spectacle. It's Muhammad Ali. It's Evil Knievel. And now we've got Billy Jean versus Bobby. Yep. And that morning, people's hearts are crushed, broken, because Jim Croce will no so longer be So there's a sacrifice. Fighting. There's a changing of some kind of guard or some kind of switching of, you know, Billie Jean King is the woman beating the man, but she's also a woman with a man's name, right? And right. then our last episode was around this Serena Williams thing. Of course, Billie Jean King is constantly inserting herself in all of these controversies surrounding racism, sexism, Serena Williams, all this kind of stuff. It, it, what is this? <laughs> this is like, what is this? There's some deep entanglement here. Yeah. Yeah, and then don't forget Michael Jackson's big hit is Billie Jean. Oh, yep. Mm-hmm. And there's, yeah. wow. And there's questions around him about whether he's black or white and whether he's man or female, male or female. and Human you know, or alien. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> and, and, right? And people are asking those same questions about Elon Musk, whose Tesla plant is there. Is he human or alien? Yep. Right? Like, mm-hmm. we are getting to some really core questions about, I mean, and this is just a, like a symbolic uh, representation of it. Some really, really core questions about what this is, who are we, who is everyone else, what is going on, what things are connected to what, what actually makes stuff happen in the world, what is the energy behind it, what is the energy behind clean energy? Is it sexual trauma? Is that why Diane Feinstein collects these things? That she had somehow, like, um, what do you call it when something takes one energy for one thing and tra- changes it into an energy, like some kind for another thing, right? Is she like a. Uh, well, su- a succubus just sucks energy. Right, but she's tra- like, you know. Well, like, she, she would be like a, like a transmutator, right? Yeah. Or, or transistor. I mean, possibly. I mean, I mean, she's not knows? doing very well with the clean energy thing, but it is interesting that, like, it does seem like the people who care about clean energy don't seem to care that much. Well, they care about Me Too kind of uh, of sexual trauma and pedophilia or whatever, and stuff, but they don't really care about pedophilia. I don't, it's so, like, I mean, I, I'm not clear on what this is, but there is, there is a, a knot here. You know what I mean? And we're pulling at the strings of it, and it'll be very fascinating to see how we can, uh, un, un, unwind or unravel some of this in the you know weeks to come. I think I think something's going to come out with Feinstein. Yeah. I mean, I was looking at her progress chart, and I was looking at her her chart in um, in Washington D.C., which is very different than her her U.S. Her, I'm sorry, her uh, San Francisco chart. Yeah. But I think something's going to come out around her, and in the not too distant future, she's she's getting into territory now where I think certain people are starting to pay attention Mm -hmm. and there are people that are, you know, research oriented and people that are, that are looking at this and going, Hmm, what's going on with this person? I mean, there are even invested in this. There are even liberals who are really questioning the timing of what she did and why she didn't do it back in July when she first found out. Yeah. That's yeah. That's an issue. Yeah. 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 Wow. All right. We went a little bit further today than we normally do. <laughs> and you did point out, also I thought it was fascinating how you pointed out how Billie Jean and Diane Feinstein look alike. 
They do. <laughs> and they both wear pearls, dude. What is it with these ladies who like are awful looking that wear a string of pearls? Like they think that's going to make it better. Well, I, I, what do they say? You like the uh, pearls and swine or something like yeah. that? What's, what's the, uh, yeah. Casting pearls, pearls before swine. swine. Yeah. But it's like trying to put lipstick on a pig too. Lipstick on a pig. There we go. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, right. Jasper? What do you think? Jasper's beyond all this. Jasper's man. suddenly silent. He's beyond all this stuff. He keeps looking at the green light, though, the green camera light. Like, he knows what's going on. <laughs> of course he does. He knows yeah. that this is he'll, – he'll know when we're off air, and he'll, you know, go back and do something else. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, Emily, this is a great episode. And, yeah, I think we had a successful second date. Yeah, I think so, too. I think we can do it again. We can hook up again, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys, you can catch Robert at robertphoenix.com. Get yourself a reading. You can find me at offplanetradio.com. And if you're interested in getting your health and wellness in order, hit me up on Facebook at Emily Moyer, and we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye.